Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of today's event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access that webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll take a few minutes near the end of today's webinar to go through those questions. And also at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our lucky winners. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is protect yourself from cyber attacks through proper third-party risk management. Our speakers today are Tony Howlett, who is CISO at SecureLink, and uh, also Justin Stackany, Strackany, sorry, uh, who is CCO of SecureLink. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. Awesome, Thank awesome. You, well, Tony, Tony, I'm turning it over to you, and let you, I'm going to put myself on mute and let you get right to it. Fantastic, let's dive right in. So uh, we'll be talking today about uh, how to protect yourself from cyber attacks and primarily in the realm of uh, serious threat actors, cyber terrorism, cyber war, major nation state actors, um, and why third party risk management matters in this regard. Uh, first of all, I'll kind of set the state of, of how we got here. Um, and uh, then I'll talk about the different uh, actors and the methods that they use and uh, different attack vectors that they they use. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Justin and he's going to talk about ways to protect yourself and best practices for managing this th third party risk. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll jump right in. So where are we and how did we get here? Uh, in this day and age, uh, we see often see uh, countries, nation state actors and other large groups looking to achieve their means uh, through uh, the internet through cyber means instead of the uh, traditional ways that they might carry out uh, acts. So uh, hence the rise of cyber war, cyber terrorism, and, and nation states in uh, cyberspace. And the reason that they've done this uh, is there's a lot of advantages to them. They're very fast. They can uh, send these attacks at the speed of light from anywhere on the globe to anywhere. They don't have to worry about borders and all those uh, uh, messy things. They can just send their attack from anywhere uh, across na national boundaries. Um, they're fairly low cost uh, to execute this kind of attack. You really just need uh, uh, the uh, hackers or the technicians and computers. You don't have to send tanks or bombs or any other thing like that, any kind of ordinance other than uh, bits and bytes. Uh, they can be very hard to attribute. So if the uh, perpetrator, for whatever reason, doesn't want to be directly tied to the act or possibly just loosely tied to it, or it can't be proven, they can be concealed, hidden, or otherwise obfuscated. Um, if the attack fails, uh, we may never know. Um, so unlike uh, uh, things in uh, what we call meat space, uh, if you attempt an act and it fails, uh, usually that's publicized, but uh, cyber acts uh, usually just fizzle out uh, and uh, they may not have to uh, get blamed for that. And uh, finally, uh, what they're you know what they're trying to do uh, is cause chaos, confusion, uh, loss of productivity, and possibly a, a real national damage, uh, maybe even uh, damage to people and lives. So uh, this is a way they can do that again without a lot of those other downsides. So uh, this is something that for years, decades, uh, you know, people wrote about it. Tom Clancy, if you read him. Uh, and uh, it was always the thought, but it is real now. It's really being used uh, by these groups to carry out their uh, their goals. Uh, so depending on how you count it, Sony might be seen as one of the first acts of cyber war uh, and carried out against a company, an American company, well, Japanese company that had a lot of American interests, so two different countries affected. Uh, and uh, their corporate servers were hacked. Uh, and a lot of their content, their upcoming movies were, were released on the internet. And then more, more so uh, their email servers. So a lot of embarrassing 
uh, conversations about uh, negotiations and actors and so forth. And as, as you probably uh, know, actors have very prickly egos and don't like to be uh, talked about. This was uh, attributed to North Korea during a time when a movie that that uh, was they didn't like was was put out. And again, uh, damaged that company, uh, their intellectual property, and actually caused a lot of the top of the executives to have to leave because of their emails that were revealed. Um, the other um, uh, event, uh, which uh, was much larger scale, uh, was an attack on a nuclear facility in Iran. Uh, and a specially designed virus called Stuxnet went after their uh, nuclear centrifuges and uh, actually managed to damage almost a thousand of them. Um, this has been attributed to uh, the U.S. and Israel. Um, again, never positively identified. Um, and many people, uh, myself included, saw this as a good thing, avoiding a real war uh, uh, by uh, damaging their nuclear program. However, obviously, on the other side, they may not, may not have seen it that way. And the downside of all this is this virus made it out into the wild and other bad actors were able to uh, take it, look at it, uh, break it down, and then reuse it. So uh, great for us in, in one attack, but now that's being that same tech is being used against us. So um, there was a power plant in Ukraine uh, that had their operations shut down uh, for an hour by uh, malware that uh, got into their plant. And it, again, was designed to go after that equipment, uh, probably uh, Russian actors since the Ukraine and Russia don't get along right now. Uh, and even uh, though it, uh, it caused a power outage, it, it looked like uh, that it was designed to cause long-term damage to the equipment. Uh, cycling those large uh, circuits and, and breakers in, 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 in a plant like that can really uh, uh, cause problems. So they didn't quite get their aim, uh, but that's what they were trying to do. And uh, more recently, um, uh, again, uh, when we had the issues with Iran late last year, they uh, launched a large DDoS attack against the city of Las Vegas, right during the time when their one of their largest uh, trade shows was going on. So um, this was uh, obviously Las Vegas represents a uh, symbolic target against what they stand for, Sin City and so forth. And uh, luckily the, the attack was repulsed. They had the proper things in place. Full disclosure, uh, City of Las Vegas is a, is a, a securing customer. And I'll just I'll leave it at that. So, anyways, this is just a short list. Uh, there have been uh, a lot more acts, and in fact, even more recently, uh, uh, a lot more to add to the list. But this is just an example of the breadth and the different uh, things that they're going after. Uh, yeah, here's the the article about uh, this attack came during CES, the, one of their largest trade shows, and so it would have caused major economic damage to the entire city had they managed to be successful. Fortunately, they weren't. So I wanted to talk about uh, these different actors. They call them uh, the Advanced Persistent Threat Actors, APTs. Uh, these are folks who uh, are, are around, are gonna be around for a while. They have long-term goals. They're not just a bunch of guys in a bedroom uh, trying to make a little bit of money or, or cause uh, some embarrassment. Uh, they're quite serious. So China is the biggest actor in this area. Um, they have many different groups. They number these uh, APTs depending on the uh, maybe the division or what they're after. Uh, and they have, as you can see, uh, a whole bunch of different APTs depending on if it's a, a regular military group, an irregular group, or maybe even just a proxy group. They have over 100,000 cyber soldiers full time uh, working on these projects, which uh, usually uh, lean towards the military industrial. So they're after uh, trade secrets. Uh, they even technology companies as well. Obviously, they want to they want to see their their technology companies to be successful. Um, and uh, these type of groups, they want to get in and stay in. So they're not necessarily wanting to damage these systems. They want to get in and steal information and be able to stay there and continue to steal information. So um, again, these groups all have different motivations and different timelines about what they want to do, which affects the kind of attacks they're going to perpetrate on your on your organization. Um, Russia also has a number of groups and they named them after the bears, uh, Cozy Bear, Fancy Bear, Venomous Bear, and Voodoo Bear. Uh, that's the national symbol of Russia. Uh, and their uh, targets are a little different. They're after influence operations. So they're looking to get into political organizations, possibly voting systems, uh, uh, financial infrastructure, things like that, and affect uh, the mood and the politics in the countries that they're trying to operate in. 
And uh, of course, they also have the generic cybercrime. Many of the affiliated groups are Russian mafia and so forth connected to the government uh, that, that are just out there to, to make money. Uh, Iran, again, a different, uh, different angle for these guys. Their groups are named after kittens, and don't ask me why. Maybe somebody knows uh, if that's the national symbol of Iran, but they're, they're after uh, they're, they're, uh, kittens, APT39, and they have a whole lot of smaller proxy groups that aren't directly affiliated or even coordinating with the government, but share their goals. And that's the, the nice thing for them is they can have things happen and say, hey, we didn't do that, uh, as these other guys. Hezbollah, et cetera. Uh, and they are typically after uh, the United States, Israel, and related groups and companies and so forth. And they are, tend to be after a slightly shorter term uh, goal. So they might want to deface websites and put up their political messages or even cause uh, destruction of infrastructure and cause some sort of a physical incident in the real world. And finally, uh, North Korea. Uh, has their own groups as well. They're they're smaller, but they are quite sophisticated and able to uh, have an impact, as we saw with Sony and some other areas. And uh, these guys are, tend to be uh, more money focused, though. North Korea is a poor country, and they like to fund their operations through cybercrime. Um, and again, this isn't a complete list. You can go and Google APT groups and see a whole chart of the different groups and uh, and what they do. But uh, these are the major ones. Uh, just a picture here so you can get a feel for this. This is just one APT and one scene, and it looks like mission control there with hundreds or thousands of, of Chinese cyber soldiers uh, working day and night, uh, three shifts to hack into to whatever they're told to hack into, a, a military or possibly a company and so forth. So, uh, and again, this is just one of their groups. So, who are they after? Well, the obvious targets are the government entities. Um, they're going to be looking to do uh, military things and, and often want to get in and stay in and be quiet so that if they need to activate, they're still in there. Um, there's a lot of cyber tech in our drones and things like that. So obviously uh, being able to attack those in a cyber fashion. Um, they're also going after the regular civil organizations, federal, state, and local uh, to be able to get into critical services uh, and things like that maybe gather data on the citizens and government workers. And again, like I talked about voting operations, disruption of services, so forth. And even down to quasi-governmental agencies, school districts, municipal utility districts, uh, this is where they can disrupt critical services that affect a local area, or maybe even just ransom, ransom those systems and get some money. But uh, it's not just government entities, especially here in the US, uh, we are mostly private, corporations uh, doing a lot of the government work. So government contractors uh, build a lot of our military tech. In fact, they build all of it. Uh, so if they can get in there, they can steal that IP and those designs and plans. Um, the financial markets, um, and here they can cause financial chaos uh, and, and so forth, maybe steal money. Um, healthcare, so they would look to disrupt services and again, uh, sell or ransom that data that they can get into. Um, manufacturing. Uh, they might want to insert backdoors, uh, cause flaws, uh, or even cause industrial accidents. Um, so uh, going back a little ways, uh, uh, operations that we used to do against uh, both Russia, North Korea, Iran is uh, the supply chain uh, and put uh, flaws into nuclear components. So uh, when they built them and put them into a centrifuge, it might not work and they might not know why. Uh, the bad guys are trying to do that as well. Uh, and utilities, obviously very important to modern life, electricity and, and so forth, and water. Uh, if they can cause uh, disruption to that, that's uh, pretty pretty bad. And then energy producers to upset supply chain and, again, industrial accidents. So lots of, lots of possible targets in private enterprise. Uh, and here is this uh, example. You know, this is uh, the government sending out a, a warning. Uh, DHS about that uh, response to the military strikes. Um, and if you're in a uh, protected industry or a regulated industry, you probably got these. So they, they send them out uh, on a regular basis now whenever they uh, anticipate that some uh, APT might be making a major operation. And I guess finally, to uh, uh, put a pin in it, uh, uh, some of these groups actually want to cause uh, destruction and loss of life 
uh, both like from an industrial accident, but in the healthcare uh, arena, a lot of these devices now, these IoT devices are connected to patients and patient systems. So uh, if you affect those, you can possibly affect someone's health or even cause uh, loss of life. So uh, really, really uh, serious stuff now. We're not just talking about losing money. So I want to talk real quick about uh, uh, what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, go ahead. Slide. So these, these APT groups, um, they are uh, usually have a lot of folks uh, working for them and they can specialize and they're getting pretty sophisticated. Uh, they have specialists who work on just the coding. They have folks who work on penetrating networks and getting through firewalls, uh, really sophisticated network engineers. Then they have what we call the social engineers who work on getting in through other methods, phishing uh, and other uh, trickery. And now they even have PR and marketing arms. So they know how to contact the press and announce that they've hacked into something. Uh, and they, they're pretty sophisticated in getting that propaganda value. And uh, like any other large organizations, they're not opposed to outsourcing to other specialists. So they might have contractors, other outside firms. The Internet Research Agency was one in, in the last election that was used for a troll farm by the Russians. It was a company uh, that all they did was uh, go around and troll on, on forums and stuff and create uh, discord. And Guccifer 2.0, of course, uh, was feeding information to WikiLeaks. Uh, and we all, we all know how that turned out. So. Another thing that they, they like to do is write their own code. Um, you know, they have the resources and they're not going to necessarily be using any off the shelf uh, kitty script kitty where uh, they can write their own code or they might uh, adapt existing code to a specific target or even specific elements within an environment. Uh, you know, the best example is that Stuxnet virus I talked about, one of the most sophisticated pieces of malware ever written. Um, and it was designed very specifically to activate when it found a specific number of Siemens microcontrollers in a very specific array. It just happened to match the internal configuration of that nuclear plant. That's how they designed it to only attack that plant. Unfortunately, there was a flaw in it. It got out into the world and, and actually infected a lot of other computers. And that's how we found out about it. But uh, uh, that piece of code was quite a, quite a masterpiece of malware. Uh, they'll also leverage uh, zero-day exploits, and these are uh, uh, bugs in software that have never been published. In other words, we don't know about them yet, uh, and uh, these zero-days are quite powerful because there's, it, it's kind of, I hate to use a modern uh, example, but the coronavirus, there's no, it's, it's novel, there's no defenses against these cyber uh, bugs, so uh, they will work on almost anything, and uh, they buy them on the open market or they have contracts to create them. They can be quite valuable. Uh, but once they use it, uh, it gets publicized and gets patched. So they save these things for their special operations. To give you an example, Stuxnet took advantage of three different zero days. So if it tried one and didn't work, it would try the next. So it was very, very uh, heavily loaded. And uh, finally, and then part of the rest of our presentation is a great tactic of theirs is to uh, go after vendors and uh, ma managed service providers. Uh, kind of as a force multiplier. So instead of hacking into one company or one organization, they'll hack a provider that services many hundreds, dozens, thousands of organizations, and now they have access to many, many uh, sites. Um, and uh, all the APTs have been doing this to a greater or lesser extent. China is a great uh, user of this tactic. They've hacked into 45 different MSPs and other technology companies in the last couple of years. Uh, there was an example here in Texas where 22 cities were taken down simultaneously uh, by hacking an MSP that they all mutually used. So it is a, is a great way to uh, get a lot of bang for your hacking buck. And here's a, another example of the DHS warning about this tactic, about them using MSPs. And this has really come out of the idea that over the last uh, decade or so, we have more and more outsourced key IT functions and key IT uh, infrastructure. So uh, it started off maybe as non-essential functions 
back office, HR accounting, but it's really moved into everything we do, right? Uh, even our, you know, it used to just be non-core functions, but now, uh, especially in healthcare, you have third-party providers doing uh, uh, equipment and so forth. You have infrastructure, your servers exist on, in the cloud perhaps. So uh, now these third parties are probably in every part and every aspect of your operate, IT operations. And what this has led to is really a, a third-party access tsunami. A lot of outsiders having access to your most critical systems. Uh, in a study done recently, uh, the average enterprise had 67 vendors with privileged access to their systems. Uh, on the flip side, the average uh, tech vendor might have 238 customers. Again, that idea of hack one vendor, you get access to hundreds or even thousands of, of uh, potential victims. And what we end up with is uh, dozens or hundreds of, of third party uh, operators inside our networks on the average week, 182 uh, in this study. And again, they might have uh, system administrator accounts. Uh, they might be coming in on uh, relatively insecure VPNs, uh, sharing credentials, accessing your most critical systems, your servers, your 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 you know devices that provide services, and into that sensitive data like that PHI or PII that that we have to protect and is regulated. So, you know, we got this problem and there's a lot of barriers to fixing it. Uh, you know, there, there's really hasn't been a, you know, dedicated budget uh, until recently for third party uh, risk management. Um, you might be using uh, the wrong tools like a VPN that you use for your employees. Um, or you might actually have to be use a whole bunch of platforms if you have different vendors that make you use their platform and you're managing all these different platforms. Uh, you've got decentralized uh, vendor managers. And finally, you do have to get the vendor to follow your processes and get them to buy in. So you end up with this kind of teeter-totter of security on one side and efficiency on the other. Uh, and there's always a tug of war between uh, what the enterprise needs and what the vendor needs. And depending on the size of your org and the size of the vendor, they may have more heft than you do. So, um, so these are all the challenges. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to Justin now to talk about some of the possible solutions. Great, thanks, Tony. So um, before we get into uh, some of the practical ways to protect your organization with third parties, I just want to underscore what Tony said. You know, with uh, a lot of a lot of times, you know, the there's a tendency with cybersecurity to think of that as some uh, something that's happening to other organizations, to the government, to um, these big companies and to a lot of time and a lot of times that's true um and also for things like perimeter defense there are very reputable solutions you can use to uh, have advanced firewalls and to make sure that you're not vulnerable you could simply not put anything publicly online and uh have a really good a phishing education program to protect your organization. But vendors are a little bit different, which is why we focus on them here at SecureLink, because no matter what, if you purchase software and it lives in your network or in the cloud somewhere, you can't avoid needing people who you didn't hire, who you don't know coming in and um, you know, again, to use the maybe tacky coronavirus uh, allegory, it's, you know, you can make sure that you're washing your hands or that you're keeping socially distant, but you're only as protected as, you know, the uh, most socially distant person in your peer group if you go outside, etc. And that's the case with vendors. You're only as secure as your least secure vendors, people who have these really elevated privileges to the most important parts of your network, much more than probably 90% of your employees. So, you know, and, and that's something where, as we saw with these examples of cities in Florida and, and Texas and, and other states, you know, it's small, relatively small networks can be uh, compromised uh, through 
I mean, if, if you're able to successfully hack a technology vendor, you might as well go after every single one of their customers. So what I'm going to go through are some practical ways that uh, beyond, you know, purchasing a, a bunch of expensive security software in your organization today, you can help uh, protect yourself. And really what we find is, you know, uh, we work with basically every industry um, that, uh, you know, from legal to gaming to hospitality, government, uh, healthcare, all of these have different regula regulations and uh, compliance measures. But really, when when they're all boiled down to uh, as far as what they have to say about third parties, they coalesce around three main topics. The first a need to identify and properly authenticate. Usually that's an allusion to uh, multi-factor authentication and identify being able to have named users. So that means no shared accounts, but uh, individually identify every person coming into your network, regardless of who their employer is. To control access, to properly segregate access so that if I support five systems on your network, I have network access to five systems. I don't have access to 300 systems and we're hoping that uh, I only decide to log in or we're trying to make sure that we remember to set the right you know, login privileges in Active Directory. And then finally, to record and audit all those connections so that if there is something strange going on that we have a record that if we need to identify for compliance reasons or for forensics okay who all logged into this machine that you know is showing signs of being hacked over the last 30 days or during the day when we first saw the issue uh, without that very difficult to try to figure out and then later prevent future incidents of these sorts of things happen. So this is how we're gonna structure our best practices here. So first off, let's talk identifying your vendors. So 37% um, of enterprises are, forget about even protecting yourself. They're not even sure who all the companies are who are accessing their networks. Um, and that's because these all live in different places. Um, they, you might have some in Active Directory. Uh, you might have some in a contracts database. You may have some that just sort of live in uh, the collective memory of your application owners. Uh, we've, we've kind of seen it all. I mean, that's because it may be a lot of people's jobs to define vendors in various repositories, you know, help desk contracts, compliance, IT, but I, it may not be someone's job to remove those vendors. You, know, you may just be relying on your contracts department to remove a vendor when you stop doing business with them. And maybe nobody's telling someone in IT to remove the 100 individual accounts or the several shared accounts that you're using. So you have these legacy uh, lists that sort of corrode over time to where you're not even sure you'll have 10,000 records and you're not really sure you know, which ones should be eliminated or not. So the first thing we, um, we recommend is not to manage users with your internal Active Directory. Here are some examples of what you may see. Um, it's just too difficult to manage. Uh, if you think about it, we, we talked about these 67 vendors that the average enterprise has, 25 individuals. So that is, you know, uh, rough math, maybe 2,000 uh, people accessing an organization, maybe 1,500. So how are you going to get those 1,500 names? Well, you'd probably have to write 67 companies uh, in order to, and get them to comply with sending you a list. And then if they hired somebody or let someone go, you'd have to make sure that they notified you. And then you'd have to have someone on your team when they got these spreadsheets to enter them in 
And every time they received an update from these 67 companies, you'd uh, have to then remove them. And then you'd probably have to build it into your contracts and the vendors would have to say yes, even large vendors like Cisco or Cerner or you know um, Microsoft. And that would be really difficult. So it's just impractical and it lends itself to something that we'll talk about, which we really want to avoid, which is the idea of uh, shared accounts. So, um, and also Active Directory, it's meant for internal users to access, for the most part, non-privileged systems. Profiles are for things like checking email, um, certain basic file operating system access, printing, accessing map drives, never really meant to apply to super user privileges on highly sophisticated machines that maybe shouldn't be granted 24 by seven and where you might need additional personally identifiable information to tell who's a valid employee of a vendor and who is not. So to that end, we uh, also do not want to allow these generic or shared accounts. And here's why. Let's say we, we, uh, we just don't have the staffing or the budget to create these individual accounts and we're only getting a 50% acceptance rate on our vendors, which would be good uh, on, in our experience. So you do the only thing you can, which is create some, you know, secure link to underscore admin account or blue soft dash VEN account, whatever syntax you use. Well, let's say I'm a hacker and this is something that is absolutely done. It's a trick of the trade. Um, if I can find this single password, the single account, which the more complex you make it, the more likely it is to be written down on a sticky note or on a whiteboard or in a text file that's attached to Salesforce or something like that. If I get this one password, I can come in and I look just like the other 30 employees of this vendor. Um, and if I just quickly you know, log into some machine and then don't do anything for a few weeks, um, it's very hard to spot, especially if we don't have an audit and some access control and some of these other things. Um, so it just greatly magnifies the risk. And that's, and that's just the criminal aspect. You may also have a bad actor who leaves the company but retains your password. And because it's the password still used by the other 24 employees, um, that person can still get in uh when they probably should no longer have access so to i so really our best practice here um ideally we want to be identifying in every individual um and you're probably saying well justin you just told us that that's impossible uh, we have some tips to do that which which i'll share in a little bit uh, so we want to be able to create it efficiently um, we want to make sure it's given least privilege. So you allow access, basically you, you start by denying everything. I think in terms of a box. We don't put anything in the box and then we agree one at a time the things that we're going to put in our box of access for each vendor. And then, we'll, then when we want to make sure that we're disabling these vendors when they're terminated on our side. And we want to leverage when our vendor is at a their most cooperative, which is during renewals and initial purchase, some things to get these things into our service level agreements. Make sure we're holding our vendors to a minimum security posture um, when they're likely to agree to anything. Um, we don't want to be draconian per se, but we want to make sure that that a vendor is, you know, um, doing the things to remove vendors and make sure people can't log in. Um, when they leave the company, etc. Finally, with um, or another thing with I identifying is enforcing multi-factor authentication. Sophisticated passwords are great, um, but they're only uh, can do so much. Every password, you know, can be written down, and the more complex you make them, like I've had companies that don't let you use your last ten passwords. 
Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've got like six passwords, maybe. So when you start making me get to my 10th password, I'm out of ideas. So I start adding a one or an exclamation point or writing it down because I can't remember what my last passwords. So these efforts to make things more secure actually end up making them less secure just because of our, you know, our human um, limits as far as, you know, remembering things, especially if my other 700 customers are doing something similar, but slightly different. Now, how am I supposed to remember these 700 passwords without needing to uh, write something down? So this multi-factor authentication should be uh, a one-time password. It should uh, expire after about 15 minutes. And should, this is the tricky part, should also do something that uh, to define employment. So let's say your factor is my cell phone. Great authentication factor, widely used. And that probably does a good job of ensuring that it's me. What it does not do is ensure that I'm still employed at my company unless my company gave me my cell phone, which is probably not the case. So if I leave SecureLink, I may still have a cell phone. And as you know, bad actor uh, Justin with a Fu Manchu mustache, uh, I will uh, still retain both factors I need to access your network. So this just uh, says that again, we want uh, a tool to verify uh, verification on login. Uh, a lot of times, you know, something as simple as a corporate email address that's assigned to me will do the trick, or only allowing access from my business's approved IP address. Something like that is a nice uh, other aspect, which is relatively easy to put in place. Um, and then have some sort of verification before enabling, you know, some sort of uh, two way communication. Um, with frequent reporting from the vendor as far as who's still employed, you know, quarterly, I think is a is a reasonable um, frequency to put in place, that, which is not too burdensome for the vendor. So next step, controlling your vendors. First, we want to make sure that uh, the vendors are using uh, secure methods. To access your network. That is some way of ensuring that there is at minimum some form of antivirus or um, internet you know, security software on the machines that they're connecting from. A lot of organizations will mandate what I like to call a clean room for this, where everybody needs to log in from a sacrosanct environment or machine like the DOD and, and, um, and VA do things like this to uh, to connect first. And then there needs to be a minimum encryption and cryptography where the encryption is of a minimum, a minimum complexity, <laughs> excuse me, to is not be uh, hackable. But then there are also measures put in place in the cryptography and the settings, which is slightly different to ensure that it meets um, minimum strength to avoid common uh, attack vectors. And then we want a least privileged access. So again, this is something where um, we don't allow access to the entire network where they're just a node. This makes sense to a degree if you're an employee and might be browsing to various systems at any point in time, especially if you're an IT or help desk. It doesn't make sense for, when you're a vendor supporting a single server, there's no reason you should need to get access to anything else. And we would suggest taking it so far as specific ports. So if they're accessing a Windows server, grant them RDP access, or maybe they only need access to the database and we can just grant them a database port. These are questions that we should li likely be asking vendors, again, right at that point, where uh, we're about to start doing business with them uh, for the first time. We don't, we don't want to allow scanning the network for open ports. Um, 
like you know an, an NFS or something like that, and we don't want leapfrogging, which basically means um, my I have one I get to one machine, and that's the machine your network report says I get access to, and then I have a bunch of other passwords where then I jump to the next machine. This uh, you'll see desktop sharing solutions, you know, like uh, BombGar or or WebEx use this. Um, which is great for collaborative uh, console-based sort of attended remote support, but then when it's used to actually make another hop to an actual server, when it comes time to figure out what happened, very difficult because you'll only know that a web meeting took place and that some centralized, you know, a jump server was taking place, not the actual destination server. And we want to make sure that access approvals are decentralized. What does that mean? Well, many organizations do the opposite of that, which is centralized, which means all access approvals happen through a help desk or central IT force. And when you're small enough where the IT vendors have relationships with the vendors, that might be doable. But as you get larger, and you might move into 50, 100 different vendors or multi-site if they're calling the help desk, the help desk doesn't know whether they need access or why or to what or whether this vendor is trustworthy or not. Um, it's the application owners who are likely opening the case in the first place. So we want to have a method, ideally, where the application owners can enable access and then the IT and security departments determine what access is enabled for how long and to what degree and under what approval parameters the application owners can enable the access. It's the most efficient way. We don't want application owners having to go into the firewall or to, into Active Directory or to allow access to new hosts. That's IT's job. But the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, we it, it makes sense to me that application owners should have that power. Um, because you know their their focus should be the vendor, and it's much more efficient. We want our help desk focused on helping internal users, uh, where everybody's sort of doing the thing that they're best at. And finally, vendors should not know network credentials. What we want to see is uh, individual passwords that the vendors know that get that prove you should be able to access the network in some form. In other words, I like the term of a lobby where um, that the vendor's been approved, great. So I believe that you're Justin, that you work at SecureLink and you are uh, accessing me to do me no harm. Um, but now we need to figure out how we're gonna get you access into the sort of tender underbelly of the network um, where we don't necessarily want to have you uh, know all these privileged passwords. And this is where having some kind of credential vault, uh, we see PAM solutions uh, being leveraged a lot for this sort of thing, um, where that's the one in a perfect way we wanna be caching or injecting or you know uh, entering it automatically, this sort of password that is never revealed to the vendor. And guess what? That's great for vendors too. They don't wanna to have to go look up your password or go wait for you to reset their password. Um, so it's definitely more secure and more efficient when done the right way. Um, so gets both sides the thing that they really want and are measured on. So finally, let's talk through auditing your vendors. So what we wanna do is tie um, contextual, first off, we wanna tie contextual info to audit. Your VPN logs are helpful, but what they generally will say is some user ID, which hopefully is not shared, but if it is, you know, even more limited, some timestamps, when they connected, maybe when they disconnected, and maybe the network IP address that they initially connected to externally. So this is hard when you have a lot of people coming in and maybe you have a remote workforce, this big VPN log file is going to be thousands of rows per hour. So to find, you know, some bad actor or a cyber criminal, it's going to be really hard, like a needle in a haystack. 
So if we can find contextual information, even if somebody accidentally upgraded the wrong server, if we can look at it and we can say, oh, all of these had a case and the vendor tells me that each of these cases are valid, but this one didn't have a case or this one didn't have a reason for connecting. These little human measures, uh, cyber criminal is not gonna be able to pass that. Um, so finding a way to incorporate a conversation or a entry form or a summary form or something like that is going to help because it then makes the deviations from that policy much more apparent. So um, as far as an audit, we want to have a single source of truth uh, for third-party remote access. The longer it takes to detect a breach, the more expensive it will be. And that just makes sense. Um, a lot of times, uh, hackers won't, they'll come in and they won't do anything for months. Why? Because they're, they, they're learning your network. They probably established a beachhead on some vendor server that doesn't have anything that they need. The target HVAC vendor comes to mind. Um, but then they'll figure out, all right, well, are there any internal systems which aren't patched with the frequency of external systems that have an old Apache web server or have a database that allows cross-site scripting or that my initial password still works on because they uh, somebody made a mistake? And they'll just figure it out. And over time, they'll sort of wor worm their way into the parts of your network that they really want. And that may take weeks or months of just little probing, um, but the more they're there, the more damage that's done. Uh, so we wanna be able to see that in the audit. Um, we wanna be able to dis uh, disable any unapproved methods, and we wanna have a single audit trail of everything where when you're audited, I mean, uh, we have a stat that's something like, uh, weeks of man hours are used gathering all the collections of data uh, to satisfy auditors when they ask, all right, tell me all the people who've accessed the network over the last you know, few months or whatever it is. And 53% of breaches are discovered by an external source. That means if you go through the trouble of having an audit, establish a review process. You can, you can automate this maybe, uh, with some business intelligence initially or some intrusion prevention, but then have some sort of, just the, the act of reviewing your security policies, reviewing your vendor policies, uh, reviewing your audit, have a, a security council, just um, you know, having that call to action will help immeasurably, at least annually. Um, and then we want some notifications with real-time audit. So if there's anything suspicious, like somebody logs in from an, um, certain known bad IP addresses, or authenticates three times in a row, or five missed passwords, there should be some sort of notification to let you know. We wanna notify you on, in ex on exceptions rather than have you necessarily go through all the time every audit. But if a breach is discovered by an external source, that means that the hack has gotten to the point where it suffered and actually notified you, or sometimes it's the hacker who notifies you because they want some blackmail payment. So uh, briefly, I want to talk about sort of an, a new uh, product on the whole spectrum of security um, or a uh, product category called Vendor Privileged Access Management. And what this is, is it takes the idea of uh, privileged access management, which is great for uh, managing privileged credentials to internal systems, but is sort of geared more towards leveraging an existing VPN and leveraging uh, identities already uh, in your Active Directory, i.e. internal employees, and add some additional functionality to make it better purposed for vendors, uh, thereby the, the vendor portion of the VPAM distinction. And what this does is, is uh, VPAM is designed to hit these three main areas. So first there'll be 
in if it's a proper VPAM solution, it's going to have tools to identify the person connecting uh, in a way that uh, lives outside of your Active Directory, kind of in that lobby access process. Uh, there'll be some sort of control, so it's going to come with a way of publishing certain hosts. It won't just be leveraging a VPN um, to give access to the entire swath of the network, and then it should audit everything that happens um, for people coming in. So think of it as a, you know, maybe like a souped up uh, secure VPN with features that uh, easily register non-employees. So uh, we're proud to be uh, one of the foremost makers of VPAM solutions. Uh, what makes us unique? We're built from the ground up for 16 years uh, for vendor management. Uh, it's We're made to support HIPAA compliance and the most stringent security standards um, across enterprise grade remote access, which means uh, we'll allow access to any network service, no matter how complex. So if you have vendors who are accessing old Unix systems or multiple servers or have complex diagnostic clients, they'll work with securely, along with your run of the mill SSH, desktop sharing, RDP, et cetera. Um, and as far as you know, this is, uh, just speaking for healthcare, but I know we have some of these for uh, manufacturing and some other industries. Uh, but our our biggest space right now is in healthcare, where we have an all-in-one healthcare offering designed to lean towards best practices, the entire vendor management lifecycle, and HIPAA and um, high-tech compliance uh, with a healthcare package. We really want you to think of us as your partner for vendor privilege access, especially now, stuck at home, um, not wearing pants. Uh, we love to have a nice diversion to talk about this thing that, that we're passionate about, um, and that is vendor privilege access. So uh, to that end, we support more, to, more than 30,000 organizations worldwide. So if you ever want to chat with me about uh, best practices or learn more about our solutions, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. Okay, I'm assuming we're gonna go right into question and answer period now. Um, we do have uh, not a whole lot of time, but let's go ahead and see what we can uh, what we can get answered for the audience real quick. If you do have a, a question for our panelists, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel. If we don't get to your question, please know that the folks at SecureLink will give you all the questions. So I'm sure they'll be more than happy uh, to answer it offline for you. Um, okay, first question, what about vendors supporting mission critical applications? Are there disaster recovery and high availability options to support these types of vendors and applications? Sure, I'll go ahead and take this one. Yeah, th um, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Some of these, when you talk about, you know, NICU and um, and healthcare and government mission critical applications, vendors need 24 by seven access to that. Uh, so you're going to want any solution you use to make sure to meet the uptime of all of your vendors. I can say that uh, just speaking for SecureLink, we support um, highly available um, access as well as disaster recovery that is location independent as well. Okay. All right. Great. Next question here. Uh, what size organization would you start changing access to application owners slash users and away from IT and help desk? I would say, you know, as a rule of thumb, um, I think of it in terms of maybe a number of vendors and I would say in the 20 vendor range, and that's going to depend you know, uh, as far as number of employees or organizations, um, but that may be in your 500 employee um, to 1,000 employee range is maybe a good rule of thumb, but it really depends. If you are in IT and you find yourself 
not really having a relationship with these vendors where that sort of discovery process is leading to unintended access, then it's worth considering at any size in the organization. All right, great. I think we have time for one more question here. Do you recommend managing vendor identities in the corporate active directory? Um, and we touched on this a little bit, but uh, no. In a perfect world, what you want um, is, and this is something we support in SecureLink, is the vendor, our, our point of view, is the vendor should validate identity. Who knows whether this person is really, you know, Justin or Tony? Well, probably our employers. So there needs to be something where I validate my identity first, like I do every day at SecureLink. And then once I've said, yes, I approve that I'm Justin, maybe in my own vendor's active directory, there is a means then of taking that tokenized identity management, presenting it to you, um, ensuring that I'm still employed there, and that should get me into the lobby. From there, the enterprise should take over, figure out, okay, great, we know you're Justin, should you be accessing our software? What systems? for how long and let us go ahead and issue you a temporary password. To me, that's super efficient and gets us out of this whole individual account, shared account conundrum that so many organizations are in. Okay, all right, great. Well, we are about four minutes to the top of the hour. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out the question and answer period. Uh, looks like we got to all the questions, but if you do have a question for either of our panelists and you want to get it in before the uh, the webinar ends, please go ahead and do so. And as I said before, uh, the folks at SecureLink will be getting a copy of all of the questions. So you will uh, definitely get an answer. Okay, before we close things out, I do want to do the drawing for the $350 Amazon gift cards that I mentioned at the top of the hour. So without further ado, our first winner today is Bob W. Congratulations, Bob. Our second winner is Lindsay M. Congratulations, Lindsay. And our third winner today is Patrick E. Congratulations, Patrick. Uh, we'll be following up with all three of you offline uh, via email to get your gift card uh, over to you. So please check your email for that. Um, want to uh, remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of today's presentation, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out an email in about an hour or so that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, Tony and Justin, thank you both so much for such a great presentation. Lots of lots of really good information. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. Looking forward to the next one. And uh, also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.